Hello, everyone. This is your favorite radio host, your only radio host and favorite girl, of course, Corinne Lafon, broadcasting to you from the lovely island of Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean on Between the Lines. And I have with me today a very handsome man. I keep telling you, you know, I only have beautiful and handsome people on my show. And before I introduce him, you see he's smiling. And before I introduce him formally and welcome him, I want to always, you know, I always say, not I want to, I always start my show off being thankful and with gratitude. And the birds, I think, are just, they're just so lovely. I'm hearing the birds in the background. They're always with me. I don't know if my guests can hear, but I think they do. They are just tweeting and singing and communicating. I don't know what they're planning, but I just love hearing them. I'm so in tune whenever I hear them. I smile. They bring a smile to my face. It just shows that life is all around us. And I'm just so thankful to be here another day, you know, to experience whatever the universe, source, God, whoever you, you know, you may follow or whatever you want to name him or her or it. I really appreciate being here today. I am so thankful. So let me tell you a bit about my guest, Steve Snyder. Yeah. Steve Snyder was born in Pasadena, California. He settled in Seal Beach, California, where he still lives today with his wife, Glenda, and where they raised three sons, Doug, Devin, and Clayton. After college, Steve worked various jobs until being employed by California Vision Service. In 1973, He's, he's younger than what you think, okay? He traveled extensively throughout the U.S., becoming a million-mile flyer, whoa, on United Airlines, American Airlines, and Delta Airlines. He saved a lot of bucks there, people. Retiring from VSP in 2009 and 36 years in national sales and sales management, he began his quest to know everything possible about the World War II experiences of his father, pilot Howard Snyder, and the crew of the B-17 Susan Ruth, which was named after his eldest sister. Gradually, it became his passion and resulted in his book, Shut Down, which we will talk about a bit later, and he will show you that. It's next to him. Steve and his wife, Glenda, have a second home in Sedona, Arizona, where they spend a considerable amount of time. Steve is an avid gardener, primarily in Seal Beach, where their yard is literally a tropical botanical garden. He needs to come to the Caribbean in Trinidad and Tobago, with nearly 100 palm trees planted in the ground. Palm trees? No, he needs to come to the Caribbean. He and his wife enjoy traveling and have been to numerous countries in Europe. The Caribbean, he was just asking me if I'm from Barbados, so if I'm located there. And Pan-Asia, some of Steve's other interests are reading, taking long walks while in Seal Beach. I'm jealous, even though I live on an island. Hiking with Glenda while in Sedona and being an avid UCLA sports fan. Welcome, Steve, to Between the Lines. He's shaking his head. <laughs> oh, UCLA is pretty bad these days. So it's hard to be a UCLA fan. <laughs> <laughs> but you're taking walks on the beach. Would you know that people always think that the beach is right outside my window because I live on an island? No, the beach is not outside my window. I would love that, but it's not. You know, there is inland. We don't live on, on, on the shores. <laughs> you know, we do have land and we do live inland and we do have to travel to go to the beach. And we don't go to the beach every day, people. You know, we, we, we would love to, but it's not something we think about. It's so funny that when you have the resources, you don't use it. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, that's so true. That's so yeah, true. And, and, and they automatically think we are natural swimmers because we are surrounded by water. No, a lot of us cannot swim. And probably, and probably that's why we don't go to the beach. <laughs> and there are people like Steve, you know, who become tourists and travel and come to our islands and they take advantage and wonder how come we don't, we don't utilize what we have naturally and you guys are begging for it. What is going on? Appreciate well, that, what you have. That, that's true everywhere around the world. The people mm -hmm. who live there don't know and don't go see what's right near them. Yeah. yeah, things that are right in front of you. I like how you said that. Things that are right in front of you, you don't appreciate. And, and I want to start on that. I mean, that, that resonated with me somehow. Why is it that, that things that are right in front of you, you're not appreciating? And, and you go searching all over the place for something that's right in front of you. 
why you go searching? Why are you looking all over the place? Why can't we see what is right in front of us? Explain that to me. I mean, you're, you're a mature man. You're married. You have three children. You know, you're a gardener. And I know gardening is very therapeutic. Tell me, tell me why it is that we cannot appreciate what's in front of us and we go searching for the same thing that's in front of us. I think we just take everything, you know, we take those things for granted. Mm. They're close. We, we think we can see them anytime we want or even with friends, see them anytime we want. But then time passes by, you don't see friends, you don't talk to friends or you don't see the beautiful things and the, the, the sights that are near you. Mm. And you get involved in your own little life and you waste a lot of time not enjoying the things that, the things and the people that are around you. Hmm. Wasting a lot of time and not, and taking things for granted. Wow. Not focusing I, on the right things. Exactly. What, what do you think it will take, Steve, for us to, to really turn things around and focus on the things right in front of us? What what do you think it will take? That's a that's a that's a big question and a good, a good question, Corrine. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think people just have to kind of, as the other expression goes, slow down and smell the roses type yes, of thing. Yes, please. Slow to <laughs> hell down. And I could tell you, I could tell you, I have slowed down significantly. And I think that's a great tip. You know, slowing down. I used to, you know, I'm a perfectionist. Um, even saying it now, it kind of cringes me because I, 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 I'm still detailed. I'm still aware I want things done well, very well, you know, meticulous and that type of thing. But I am, I am at a point where I'm like, whatever, you know, if, if, it's, if it's not going the way I want, I just walk away and come back at it another time. You know, I've taken different approaches as opposed to allowing it to get to me, my blood pressure, my shoulders tightening up, the headaches, the lack of sleep. I am like, whatever. You are not stressing me out. <laughs> That's easier to do, though, I think, if you live on an island or at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Instead in a big city. Yeah. But you can, you know, I think it comes back to... It comes back to you just making that decision. I mean, when you realize how tense your body gets, how you become, it's like Hulk. You, you, you become somebody else. You turn green. You, you bust out of your clothes. You're like, why? Look at me. Why am I allowing myself to become this way? Strange. Yeah. Strange, strange. So we're talking today about evading capture, which is a significant part of your book. And I... I why did I choose evading capture as a topic? Because it is so broad, but yet specific. What are we evading capture from? And I know your father was one of the few, if any, he probably was the only one, but one of the few from, from your book, um, avoiding capture, you know, MIA, that type of thing. And I'm thinking to myself, I mean, I just watched the movies on these things. And I'm like, I could imagine what he may have had to do to evade capture, um, not to be caught, not to be tortured, not to be, you know, thrown in jail, whatever it may be. But let's go back a little bit more. I mean, you're the son of a pilot um, whose plane was shot down, etc. Share with me what instigated or, or sparked your interest in, in searching out World War II. I mean, you grew up with your fathers. I mean, you were surrounded by planes and flying and travel. But what it is that sparked you to really get more involved? Okay, well, I was born in 1947. So it was just, you know, a couple of years after the end of World War II in 1944 and 45. And I was always interested in it because when I was a little kid, they had all these movies and I'd read books. Uh, and growing up, I knew the basic of my dad's World War II uh, history. I knew he was a, a B-17 pilot. He was stationed in England with the, in the eight, with the Eighth Air Force, uh, flew bombing missions over occupied Europe and, and Germany. And uh, in Febu on February 8th, um, actually it's coming up in a couple of days, uh, in 1944, his plane was shot down over Belgium. Wow. And he was missing in action for uh, seven months, but he evaded capture and finally made it back to uh, 
England and then uh, back home. But it wasn't until I retired in 2009 that I really had the time to delve into my dad's war history and, and more detail. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I had no intention of writing a book. I just wanted to go through all the material that my parents had kept from the war years uh, and go through that and organize it and learn a little bit more. And there were two items that were really significant. One was a diary that my dad wrote while he was missing in action about his plane being shot down, which is absolutely riveting. Mm -hmm. And the other, all the letters that my dad had written to my mother while he was stationed in England uh, before he was shot down. He was very candid in those letters and reading those was absolutely fascinating. And I became fascinated with the uh, story of my dad and his crew and I started reading book after book about the air war over Europe and uh, did uh, went on the internet and spent countless hours doing research, downloaded declassified military documents. I joined various World War II organizations, went to reunions, listening to veterans tell their stories. And finally, three years uh, into this, I just came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that it uh, needed to be told. People needed to uh, read about it. So I decided to write a book. Wow. Who has who really starts off with the intention of writing a book? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody wakes up one morning and decides, I am going to just become an author. No, it, it's just circumstances. And you just start probably journaling and then you realize, wait a minute, I have something here that can turn into a book. Hmm, never had the idea. And, and I realized that you were minding your, your father's business, reading all his love letters to your mother. What were you thinking? Those love letters, I could imagine, give us a taste of, of, of the kind of emotions that was going on between those two in, in, in that time. Yeah, they, uh, I was so fortunate that I have all those letters. And my dad, as I said, was very candid in, in his letters because he wrote about his love uh, for my mother, uh, Ruth. And, uh, but, and he was also very candid about you know, what bombing missions were like, uh, what life was like on the base in England, what was what life was like in London at the time, and escapades of him and his crew. Mm -hmm. But it was really a difficult time. Uh, it's hard for people to really grasp what the world was like back then. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the war, the U.S. was not winning the war, and it was a, it looked like there was a real danger that uh, Japan and Germany would take over the world and totally oppress the entire world. And there, there was a lot of fear and angst, and here your loved ones are halfway around the world, you know, fighting a war, um, never don't know if they're going to come back. So there was a lot of emotion in those at, at that time in, the, in those letters. They had a deep and profound love for one another. And my, they had a little baby girl. My dad, as you mentioned, uh, named his plane after uh, my oldest sister, Susan Ruth Snyder, the plane yeah. named Ruth. And so he had not only his, his bride, his relatively yeah. new bride, but also a baby girl uh, mm -hmm. back home. And when he left to go overseas, my mother was pregnant with uh, my other sister. Wow. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was a trying, it was definitely a trying time. Mm. Especially for my mother, why he was missing in action because she didn't know if she'd ever see him again. Wow, what what can we learn from that? We're here in what year are we in? Two thousand and nineteen, and you were born in what nineteen forty seven? You said, um, yeah. So you have seen and witnessed a number of things. You have your own children, your wife, you know, your children are grown, and what's going through my mind, Steve, is. You know, look at that relationship between your father and your mother. They are distance apart. She's pregnant, still have a, a, a young child. You know, he's going through whatever on his end. Physically, they're apart, but spiritually and, and, and mentally, they're still connected. What, what can the new generation, what, what, what can you share with the new generation about love and relationships because now is the time of texting, WhatsApping, you know, um, Facebooking, um, video chat. <laughs> and, 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 and he was using mail. And you know, snail mail, let me just add, you know, we don't know if some of the letters reach, how long it took, if it got lost. You know, that is what it depended on. People are not writing those letters anymore. 
you know, if you were to tell somebody to write a letter, I'd be like, what? How do you use the post office? What is that? That still exists? And I'm like, how to put a stamp? What do you mean? You lick it? Well, how do you put this thing on? <laughs> what? There's a particular envelope to send to here? What? What? Because I remember as a child growing up, if you were sending like um, foreign mail or mail to a foreign country, there were these little colored um, uh, sort of borders around a particular type of envelope that you had to use. I mean, it's so amazing. I, I mean, for us in the Caribbean, that's what we did. I remember that so distinctly. And I remember some of the, some of the paper was like blue to go to particular. I was like, what the hell? What's the difference? You know, telegram and all those things that don't exist. I don't know. It probably exists in, in Coast Guard and, and, and those type of things where they use more school, you know, people out there as a backup. But what can we, what can you tell young generation now about love and relationships, you know, compared to, to, to what your father and mother had? What can they learn? Please give us some advice on that. <laughs> well, yeah, it was a totally different world uh, back then, like you say today with social media. Yeah. There's, so, there's so much less personal contact yeah. that people have with one another. Because as you say, it's uh, through Facebook and texting and Instagram and mm -hmm. all of that, that, that connection and relationship kind of breaks down. Back then, you know, people, they dealt, you know, one-on-one -on -one so much, so much more. And writing those, those, those letters, people wrote these long letters, you know, yeah. and long <laughs> You know, the, you know, today, you know, people just have to, they have to have instant, everything's instant. Yeah, one sentence, get to the point. <laughs> yeah, but back then they went into their, you know, they expressed their feelings, I think, unlike people do today. And you mentioned those letters. That was really the highlight of those guys that were over fighting the war. That was really the highlight of, of their day or their week to get a letter from home. Mm -hmm. and it came sporadically. Sometimes they wouldn't get any letters for several days, and then a bunch of letters would come together. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they had their mail call, I mean, that was a huge uh, happy moment for them to hear, hear to hear from from home. Because back then, uh, another thing that was so different before the war started, the, the U.S. Uh, was a lot more rural. Uh, most people lived in the country; they didn't live in cities like today. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people lived on farms. Uh, a lot of these guys who went to war had never been out of their home town or country, just out of high school, mm -hmm. you know, and knew little, very little about the world. Uh, and now all of a sudden, they're in the army fighting a war, you know, halfway across the, the world. Today, everyone knows everything that's going on all around the world. You have instant communication. You know what's going on in every part of the world. Uh, back then, uh, you didn't. There was just it was a lot more more provincial. But they, I think people had a, a deep commitment uh, to one another. I think the family unit was so much stronger back then than it is yes. today. Yes. Um. Uh, you know, people who got married stay married. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you think when you think about what you have gone through, what what you're sacrificing, something bonds you. People are not bonded by anything anymore these days. It seems. They're yeah. Struggling. You know, to, yeah, they're struggling to figure out why. Why did I? I am with you. Why am I marrying you? You know. Yeah, they had a deep commitment uh, to each other back then, and I think, I think there was. Uh, I, I'm a Christian, and my my parents were 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 devout uh, Christians. And I think that faith, and I think back then, a lot more people uh, had Christian beliefs. And that was another bond that really strengthened their relationship, that they were committed to one another. And even in rough times, they were going to stick it out and uh, work it out. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that. I believe that. And, and I could imagine how torturous it is. I mean, coming back to evading capture after his pain was shut down, first to begin, for him to be alive in the first place after a plane is shut down, he must have been very well trained. And I, I could imagine the things that ran through his mind. <laughs> I just see these things in the movies, you know, for him to still be alive is, is a wondrous thing, you know, and I'm sure his faith is what carried him. Plus, of course, seeing, seeing his wife, 
you know, and knowing his children behind, you know, baby on the way and, and young one. Oh my God, the things that people do, <laughs> yeah. the, the things that people go through. So for him to evade capture, what do you think when he's out there for seven months, what he's thinking about, what, what is going through his mind? How is he surviving? What, I, I, I'm trying to, to visualize what's going on there. Well, his, uh, his plane was attacked by two German uh, fighters and uh, two of the, uh, a B-17 had a 10-man crew. Uh, two of the crew members were killed in the plane when it was attacked. The other eight members bailed out successfully. And after my dad bailed out, he came down in uh, some trees and his parachute got hung up in the trees and he was dangling 20 feet off the ground and couldn't get down. <laughs> And fortunately for him, a couple uh, young Belgian men uh, came to his rescue before the Germans got to him, uh, helped him down. They took him to a farmhouse where he stayed uh, one night. And they thought it was too dangerous for him to stay there any longer than that because there were German patrols combing the area looking for these guys that had bailed out. Mm -hmm. And then after that, he was moved from place to place, uh, from house to house. And he might stay one night uh, with with some people, it might spend six weeks. It all depended how, on how brave the people were who lived there and how dangerous the Belgium underground thought it was for, uh, for him to stay there. And it had to be uh, so stressful on him, like, or any, any guy that was shot down, because here, you know, his plane's on fire, he has to bail out, he comes down in a foreign country, has no idea where he is, doesn't know what happened to his buddies on the crew, can't communicate with the, uh, the military, wow. he's dealing with people that uh, he can't speak the language, uh, he doesn't oh, know French. I didn't they, even think about that. <laughs> so they communicate, and any one of those people that are helping him might be a collaborator and turn him over to the German secret police, the Gestapo. Yeah. And uh, so finally he got tired of hiding. Um, and he decided he'd join the French resistance and start fighting against the Germans. Uh, he word, word it came that the Allied troops had landed in Normandy on uh, D-Day, June 6th. And so he knew the Americans were coming. And before he went into the Air Force, he was in the Army for a year. So he knew how to, how to fight on the ground. So he joined the French resistance called the Mackie. And they were made up of small independent guerrilla groups located all over France. And uh, their job was to harass the, the Germans. They would disrupt uh, communication, sabotage railroad lines, uh, attack German convoys, assassinate German officers. Mm -hmm. And they got their uh, instructions over the BBC through the, through the British. And they were supplied by airdrops from the British. So that was pretty incredible that he had that he decided to do that because here he was being hidden and he was relatively safe unless somebody ratted him out and the, the Gestapo came and, and, and captured him, which almost happened a few times. But he risked his life to go fight because if the Germans had captured him while he was fighting with the French resistance, they would have shot him right on the spot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that took an amazing amount of courage to, to do that. It's quite a story, but the book's just not about my dad. It goes into detail about what happened to each member of the crew and about all the Belgian people that risked their lives trying to help them. Five of the crew members made it back home, but five of them did not. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I, I, I can't imagine. Um, I'm listening to you and that thing sounds like a movie. You make me feel like I'm sitting, <laughs> sitting in a movie theater. And the book, I can tell you, is worth a movie. It's a lot of people say that. A lot of people, and a lot of people tell me you got to make this into a movie, but that's easier said than done. We'll 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 see. <laughs> oh no, it it is it is easy to say and it is easy to do. You just believe it, think it, and it's going to happen. I'm telling you, that book is worth a movie. And I'm thinking, you know, I didn't even think about the language barrier, and I'm I'm. I'm listening to you talking about your father moving from place to place and people know, cause I'm comparing him and his life then and people know, they, they, they are so comfortable. People now are so comfortable with where they are that if you were to tell them, you have to live here one night, you have to go here, you know, your circumstances may have forced you, you know, financially bankrupt, nothing to, no resources. 
It's like, oh, well, let me dig my grave and jump in it and bury myself. But your father did it for seven months. You know, um, he didn't have a cell phone, no but Wi-Fi, you know, <laughs> you know, couldn't do it. Google Translator. Well, Google wasn't even around. Google Translator, you know, to say, well, let me use Google Translator to communicate with the Belgians, you know, or, or whoever. Nothing. The man is living from home. And I'm thinking, okay, did he have any money? Where was he working? Um, how did he, wh wh what clothes was he using? Did he use the washing machine? Did, how did he have a shower? I'm thinking oh, <laughs> all of this and then moving from and place to place. And I could understand the whole secrecy and concern about his safety. You don't know who is working for whom, you know, the, the, under, the underground type of thing. So he cannot trust. And, he, and not only that, he cannot risk those people's lives as well by him being there because he's like a runaway so he yeah. cannot be, he cannot be selfish in his thinking and say oh well i will stay here until whenever until the u.s come to get me they'll figure it out no he cannot be comfortable and it it, it comes back to what i was saying before people now are comfortable and if anything throws them off uh you know into discomfort the slightest thing they're ready to throw up their hands what can we learn from your father in evading capture that some tips from, from that era, that circumstance, that experience that we can share with people of today in terms of things that may, they may be going through that they can learn from your father? Yeah, they, they, you know, they, they call them the, the greatest generation, which I think is absolutely true. Uh, they were uh, an, an amazing generation. They, they didn't, you know, like you say, people are so comfortable today and expect things to be handed to them. And, and back then, they really had a work ethic. Uh, they had a real strong moral fiber. Um, and they knew hardship and they dealt with hardship. Uh, as you were mentioning, you know, he had, to, he had to rely on these Belgian people who he didn't know at all, 100%. Uh, you know, they would tell him where to go, when, and 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 and, and where, because again, as you mentioned, the German police, the Gestapo, was always looking for these people, and uh, they could bust in uh, a home any time, day or night, and uh, arrest the people. And the Belgian people that helped my dad, and really any uh, U.S. serviceman, were unbelievably brave people. They risked their yeah. lives those of their families to help these downed airmen who they didn't know from Adam. I am thinking that. I'm saying, what the hell? You just take somebody who's a total stranger, can't speak your language, you know he's a foreigner, into your home with your, with your family and children. Nobody's doing that now, Steve. You know this. Yeah, that my dad said that they would let him sleep in their bed. They would sleep on the floor. What? Uh, you know, food was rationed. It was hard to come by, but they would give him the largest portion of the well, food. That's not happening now. That's not happening now, Steve. You know that. Unbelievable people. And uh, several, you know, many of those people, not only did they risk their lives, but some of them were captured. Some of the Belgian people that helped uh, wow. my dad and his crew were captured, tortured, and some of them lost their lives. Oh, the wow. Camp. So they risk all to help these these guys trying to come into their country, trying to liberate them from Nazi oppression. Wow. But what can we learn from that experience? What what can we teach the generation now about being resilient, about getting uncomfortable, how learning to cope? What 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 can we learn from that? And also opening our hearts, our homes, trusting, you know taking the risk yeah and and not just relying on and depending on you know other people necessarily but you know doing it yourself you know you have a responsibility you know you were mentioning people get comfortable and i think that uh you know, like, I, I don't know. It just seems like every generation kind of gets softer. I don't know. <laughs> but I think, 
<laughs> older generations probably always think always think that way about the younger generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I, you know, my generation I think is softer than my parents' generation, and I think for the most part, you know, my or my children's generations are are you know, just uh, don't have the I don't know if the toughness is the right word uh, about it, but uh, the strength you have to have inner strength to get yeah. through hardships in life. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I if you let let's put you in the situation. Do you think you would have survived if it were you? Uh, uh, you know, I ask. I think about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I've I've thought about that, mm -hmm. and you. You know, it's it's hard to say. It, mm -hmm. It's hard to say. My 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 dad was was quite a guy. We always, when my my sisters and me, when growing up, we always kind of compared him to John Wayne. He was. Oh my guy. goodness! John Wayne was a looker. Ooh. Yeah. Well, my dad was. Uh, you know, he was six foot three. So it, you know, he was a tall guy. Actually, you know, back then he was played center on the basketball team. At oh six wow! Mm -hmm. And you know, he was a no nonsense type guy. Uh, loving father, though, but you know he was uh, uh, believed in discipline, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you work for what you get. Uh, yeah, uh, he was. Uh, but yeah, I think that that was true of most of that generation. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know whether you know that's a good question. You know whether yeah. I could have done what he did. Yeah, it's not I, a matter of doing what he did, but do you think? you would have been able to survive. You may not have done everything like what he did, but would you have been able to survive? Don't, don't think of yourself as the no person um, being in that situation. This is how the mind tends to work. Me in the no and place me back in the, in the 40s. Think of yourself back in the 40s and do you, do you think you would have survived? Do you think you would have made it? Would, I, would you have been the one being written about in the book? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the way I was raised, my dad instilled in me a lot of those those qualities, and I owe, owe him a lot for that. Mm -hmm. I, I I I think I probably sort of survived. I doubt if I would have joined the French Resistance, though. <laughs> I probably just would have stayed hunkered down and in yeah. hidden, waited for the U.S. troops to come and yeah. Uh, liberate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you probably would have taken a different action. Yeah. yeah. And we just don't know. We just don't know what what options would have been presented to you at the time. It's so funny that even if the same situation, you found yourself in the same situation as your father, being shut down, whatever it may be, that because of who we are, different options presents itself to us. So to your father, different options presented itself to him. The homes that he went to, the opportunity for him to join the, the, the French army, you know, because he heard of whatever it is. He probably got word about the US coming and that was his way out. If it were you, different options may have presented itself. It may not be the French, probably the, the, the US army may have found out where you are somehow. One of the families may have been so kind to communicate with the US, we don't know. But different options based on who we are um, that allows us to make different decisions, different choices. What do you think of that? Yeah, you're 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 probably yeah you're you're probably right. It, you know the, the choices are always and the situation is always is is always different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because we may come to a fork in the road, and it's it, it's always us. One person may take the left, one person may take the right. What makes us decide? whether we take the left or the right. Everybody wouldn't take the left, you know? No. Everybody yeah. wouldn't take the right. And you may, be, you may be there standing with your father, let's say. Both of you standing at that fork. And he may say, I'm going left, let's go left. You may say, no, no, I think we should go right. <laughs> yeah, and, and sometimes the best way is not the easiest way. Yeah, yeah. You know, it might yeah. be the hard way, but it's the best way. And we and we'll end in the best results. Yeah, yeah. Wow. The fork in the road, evading capture. I want to hop across to your website, and I want you to lift up that book there before I, I switch screens. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's your book. Shut down. It's a beautiful image. So that's the that's the um the crew there. 
Yeah, that's the crew picture. That my dad was the, uh, the the pilot, the first pilot, and as such, he was the commander of the plane and the crew. That's why he was able to name the crew after his uh, his youngest daughter. Nice. And then, uh, the things that are nice about the book is it's not all the only the story, but there's over 200 time period photographs in the book, so you can visualize everything you're reading about. Oh wow, that and book then, is for the history archives. Do you have a copy in there? And in, and in the National Library, did you give a copy? Yes, yes. Mm. And then there's excerpts. There's lots of excerpts from the letters uh, that my dad wrote, my mother wrote, and other members of the crew and relatives of the crew. Because nice. after, after their plane was shot down, the loved ones of those men, uh, either wives or sweethearts or mothers, they would write letters and, and send them back and forth. And, uh, you know, wondering what happened to their loved one, whether they'd been make it back home. And like I said, five of them made it back home, but five of them didn't. So there was a lot of joy and a lot of heartbreak as well. Oh, yeah. A lot of excerpts from those letters are in the book, which makes it very, very personal. Have you, have you, um, you said you're a member of a, lot, a number of associations and organizations. Have you given copies to those? I'm just thinking outside here because I'm into publishing and, and I'm an author as well. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, like universities, um, places that do a lot of history, um, that that book would be very helpful. Um, well, it's, uh, the book is uh, sold in the gift stores of all the uh, major uh, air museums uh, uh, mm -hmm. around the country, like the World War II Museum in New uh -huh. Orleans, the U.S. Air Force uh, Museum in Dayton, Ohio. So it's carried uh, a, a lot of places. Okay, very good. Because it needs to it needs to be seen and heard and read. I mean, that's history. You you have documented history. You yeah, know, that, uh, yeah. As as you are well aware, you know, when you're not a well, you you're a celebrity. <laughs> but if you're not a celebrity or a famous person, it's really difficult to get exposure. No matter how good a book is, unless people yeah. know about it, um, they're not going to be able to read it. So it, it's just real tough for uh, independent author uh, to get a lot of exposure. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk talk with you today. Oh, that's great. But you're a celebrity. Don't worry. And it may, <laughs> not, happen, it may not happen in your lifetime, but it will happen in some lifetime. One, one, one thing I'd like to mention uh, that's pretty interesting is that while I was writing my book, one day my wife Ask me, well, why don't you try to, why don't you find the German pilot that shot down your dad's plane? Oh my God, yes. And I thought, <laughs> well, that's impossible. You know, that's kind of a dumb question. I didn't tell her that though. <laughs> There's no way in the world I'm ever going to be, be able to do that. But like a good husband, I did what she told me to do. <laughs> Very good. Very and good. I found the German pilot that shot down my dad's book and interviewed him for the book. Whoa. Yeah, his name's Hans Berger. He's still alive. He's 95 years old now, and he lives in Munich, Germany. He's and still alive? He's still alive. Did uh, you slap him on the wrist for shooting down your father's plane? Well, actually, the gunners on my dad's plane shot him down, too. They shot each other down. Oh, okay. Well, okay. We, they kind of yeah. canceled that out. Yeah, they're even. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, he became a translator after the war, so he speaks perfect English. <gasps> So here I met the guy that shot down my dad's plane and we become friends. Look at, th listen to me. So your father, you see how things come around, Steve? The, the, you know, everything is cyclical. So what happened to your father actually was responsible for you meeting the man that shot your father's plane down that now you all are friends. You could have been enemies. You could have decided... I would hate that man. He could have killed my father. And then your wife, your wife, just out of the blue, said, why don't you find a person? Just like, listen to me. This is a movie in the making, Steve. Look, <laughs> listen to me, Steve. I said it. It was heard here on Between the Lines. And, <laughs> and when, when you have the premiere and all the red carpet, you make sure and invite me. I am telling <laughs> Well, my, my youngest son's an actor, so maybe the, the, the ultimate dream would everything be... Everything is coming in. Listen, everything is coming in. <laughs> everything is coming in. And I'm going to tell you something. I am going to see what connections I can make for you. Um, yes, yes. 
I'm going to see what connections because I need to walk that red carpet. I need to be in there. <laughs> I need to be in there. And I want to see that book on the movie screen and say, yes, I know the author of this book. <laughs> Once I tell you it's going to be a movie, it is going to be a movie. I have a, a client when, um, cause I publish books for, for my clients and help them, you know? And I told her, I said, Jennifer, this book is worth a movie, a play. You know, she's in the Caribbean in Jamaica. I said, it's, it's, it's going to be there. Do you know that is exactly what happened? She did not believe me. She said, Corinne, oh, please. Oh, please. I said, don't give me, oh, please. I am telling you, this is what is going to happen. And now somebody, I mean, her book is, is going in for some festival. It was in some festival film festival in Jamaica and now I saw it just what last week going to another festival in Los Angeles or something like that so look here I'm telling you Steve it is going to be it is going to be that man is still alive make sure that it happens between now and before he goes <laughs> <laughs> well I am I am in the process of uh, working with a filmmaker to make a documentary yes uh, about the book we've gone over to uh, Belgium and uh, uh, Germany and nice filmed hours and hours of footage now we're oh, in the process. come on you are on your way Steve stop being humble about I mean be humble but 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 don't play it down don't play it down this is shut down the movie and you need to start saying that shut down the movie I want to switch over to your website now hold on give me a minute I'm so super excited one second <laughs> <laughs> you have me excited for you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Yes. Shut down the movie. You keep saying that. That's going to well, happen. Actually, it'd be better if it was a mini series. Because oh. I think try to, trying to fit everything that's in the book into a two hour movie would be very difficult because oh. there's so many storylines. It doesn't matter to me. I just want the red carpet. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> mini series. I'd love to see you with me on the red carpet. Of course, of course. Give me the website again, Steve. It's uh, stevesnyderauthor.com. Okay, here we go. I don't care if it's a miniseries, a documentary, a full-blown movie. I don't care. I just want to be there for the red carpet. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There's the website. Yes. Beautiful, and it looks the, the 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 branding and the colors is even that of of um military kind of World War Two kind of thing. You know the kind of colors, the black and white. There was no colored movies then, no colored TV then. So it's really really cool. I like it. Yeah, if if anyone wants to buy an autographed copy of the book, they can just uh, if you scroll down the uh, the home page there, there's a little buy now button. Okay, here, and they can put in their name and stuff here. Yeah, and they you can just uh, pay with a credit card, and then I mail it uh, to them. But it's on Amazon or uh, mm -hmm. pretty much anywhere books are sold. Very good. And I think you said you had some giveaways or something. Some do you have some giveaways or something that you're doing to connect with with the listeners? Um. I can't remember if you said you had some sort of giveaways. I'm trying to remember. Um, gosh, uh, I really don't. I probably should. That's you probably good. should. You probably should. Like give a, a, a portion of the book, like yeah. the first few pages so that they could get a taste of it. Oh, or well, even, if, if or you even the love letters, even the love letters or something. If you go on Amazon, uh, you can get like, you can listen to the first chapter because it's also available as an audio book. Okay, very good. Let me see here. Yeah, you can listen to the first uh, the first chapters. There it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you can see, it's as an audio book. Okay, great. So you have all the different formats, paperback, hardcover, audio book, and Kindle. Very good. You took this okay. thing very seriously. Well, I will, if anyone wants an audio book for free, Mm -hmm. uh, just send me their uh, email address and mm -hmm. I'll send them the link to download the audio book for free. Okay, give me, give me your um, email address or should they contact you back on the website here? Um, they can contact me on the website. Uh, my email address is steve mm -hmm. 
at stevesnyderauthor.com. Okay, and let me just check the contact me page here. Oh, yes. So they can also check it here as well. Yeah. Yeah. So if they send me their email, I'll send them a link to download the audio book for free. Oh, you have a free chapter. Look at here, a free chapter for them to get, and they put in their email address. Yeah, so they can get a free chapter here and they can also contact you and they can get the, um, a free audio book once they contact you at this email address. Correct. Beautiful. Well, Steve, this has been a pleasure. We have gone way over the time, I know. <laughs> but it has been a pleasure. Well, it's been nice talking with you too. You're, you're a very nice person. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you very much. I do try my best. I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah. well, hopefully we can meet in person sometime. The red carpet, Steve. The red <laughs> carpet. <laughs> There's no hopefully in this thing. The okay. red carpet. Okay? Shut down the movie, the miniseries, and the documentary. So I'm not going with the or. I'm going with the movie, the miniseries, and the documentary. So that's the whole, right? Because I have to be there on all three red carpets. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Please tell your wife to expect me and have my room ready. Thank oh. you. <laughs> Thank you. Steve, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. I enjoy talking with you. I enjoy learning so much from you know, the past, you know, the love, the passion, the discipline, um, the family values, things that we can take from then to now, you know, people now are just, they're just losing all of that and replacing it with technology. And we really need to hone in and, and, and grab hold of this before it totally disappears. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your father's life. Uh, it was my pleasure. Uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Red carpet next. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>